Ronald Reagan was the 40th president of the United States from 1981 to 1989. If you don't know Ronald Reagan, well, you probably shouldn't be listening to this show. Nonetheless, Ronald Reagan's legacy, uh, while alternately shining and in dispute, remains an essential one. So we're lucky here at Dirty Moderate to speak to someone who will know all too well, not only about Ronald Reagan, the president, or Ronald Reagan, the governor of California, but Ronald Reagan, the dad, Ronald Reagan, the human being. That's his son, Ron Reagan Jr., the son of former President Ronald Reagan and Nancy Reagan. I'm here to talk with Ron today and what I call a deeply personal interview but everything from what it means to what it meant to grow up Reagan, uh, to talk politics, to talk religion, uh, to talk about his very poignant memoir, which was published in 2011, called My Father at 100. Of course, we will discuss the Republican Party's moral and philosophical collapse into autocracy, lies, and thievery under Donald Trump, something that I don't think either of us are proud about, uh, to say the least. So thank you for tuning in and enjoy my interview with Ronald Reagan Jr. Ron, so good to have you. Well, good to be here. I'm really glad. I mean, I feel like there's so much to talk about, uh, not the least of which are a few books which have come out, I think, reappraising your dad's legacy. But I want to start with your book, okay, which I, uh, my Amazon indicates I purchased in 2011. I have no memory of this because I remember every book I read. So I had the opportunity to read it again. Um, and I, I, one of the things that stuck out to me about the memoir, just to start, was a line um, I think that you wrote, it looks like in the introduction, and it, you wrote this, the, Ro the Ronald Reagan with whom everyone is familiar could not have existed without the Ronald Reagan he rarely let anyone see. Mm -hmm. That's really beautifully yeah. said. Let's well, talk about that. There was a sort of inner self that he had that, that wasn't accessible to virtually anybody and, and maybe not even fully accessible to himself. He was one of the least introspective people you would ever want to meet. He just did not navel gaze. And if you asked him to try, he, he would sort of react with confusion as if he didn't really understand what you were you were getting at. I remember an interview he did with Barbara Walters after he'd left office and he was doing it with my mother. And Barbara, as was her wont, uh, asked him a, a, a sort of probing question about feelings and states of mind and, and all of that. And he got this kind of quizzical look on his face and she, she registered this and then turned to my mother and said, he doesn't have any idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> he said, no, no, he doesn't. <laughs> So which was that interview, because your book obviously talks about these realizations, which were, you know, you started to think about, you know, well before he was even in his second term, but became deeply personal and painful for you. Was this late 80s when you thought that maybe he was already succumbing to Alzheimer's or was she, or was Barbara just concerned, confused because he was opaque and just didn't. No, it was really, it wasn't about Alzheimer's in, the, in that interview. It was just that she was asking him to do something that he at any age would not have, have been inclined to do. And that's look within and sort of soul search and, and regurgitate, you know, feelings that, that he might have. He was, you know, the man was born in the Edwardian era. Yeah, yeah. Know, one of the themes of the book is this, this guy is literally, if not technically, but literally from a different century. And that this is, you know, he's practically pre-Freud, not not just pre oprah Yeah, yeah. He, guys of, yeah. of his age just didn't sit around and share their feelings a lot, you know? No. Uh, they just no. got on with it. There was a, a moment in the end of the book that was very moving, though it does speak to how men, certainly men like my grandfather was born in 1918, uh, was the same way, and he lived a long time, too, where... Um, your mom had breast cancer and Ron, Ron uh, or your dad uh, ended up sobbing uncontrollably in the arms of a nurse because as you put it, he wouldn't have felt comfortable doing that with another man, which is not, he is not singled out for punishment when I say that. I mean, that's just the way it was. You know? I too, but uh, yeah, no, no, it, it's just that the doctor actually at the time sent a nurse in and realized he was just crushed by this, the fact that his wife was in surgery. Uh, for breast cancer and send a nurse in knowing 
that, he, that he, with, with a nurse he could soften up and, and be human. Uh, he wouldn't feel he had to hold it together, you know, for the guys. Um, so that's yes, that's what happened. The nurse has never spoken about what what happened in that room. One surmises that he broke down in some way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think also the book. Um, you know, is is provides a wonderful historical context to your point about being born in the Edwardian era. Um, although I don't know if people in Tampa, Illinois, would have referred to it that way, but I like that term. the 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 idea that you're sort of depicting an America, right? Especially, um, which you reference several times, that goes from the horse and buggy era to the automotive era. You know, and what that was like. I mean, that that is that's you know such a, a key tenet of industrialization and radical transformation in our society that I love that you pinpoint because it explains, right, not just specifically uh, Ronald Reagan, but it does explain how somebody of his era would view the world, you know, coming from a very humble beginning in a non-industrialized world mainly. I mean, it's not quite agrarian, but it's certainly nothing like it became. And what, how that informed his view of, of the prairie and the small town and things he often romanticized in his political and public life. Yeah, I mean, it really was a long time ago. Yeah, when he, about it. he heard as a young boy the first radio broad, public radio broadcast, KDK Pittsburgh, KDK Pittsburgh, uh, come in, and, and this seemed like magic to them that there was this little box and voices were coming out, just plucked out of the air, were coming out of there. There was, of course, no television. Movies were still silent and black and white. Um, you know, but automobiles were just becoming a thing uh, yeah. at that point. He was born in the midst of what is probably, arguably, I'm not a historian, but I will say that the, the greatest technological transformation the, the world has seen since we mastered fire. Um, that late 19th century in through the, you know, let's say the 20s, the 30s, whatever. Yeah. I mean, it was just astonishing, you know, telegraphs, you know, radio, um, television was at least thought of back then, even if people didn't have it in their homes, air travel. I mean, there were suddenly airplanes, not just balloons, you sent up airplanes. Um, and of course, you know, automobiles, automobiles, of course, transformed our cities utterly. If you go back and look at, Photograph, old photographs or even newsreel of cities before the automobile, they were completely different places, utterly different. People, there were no traffic laws for one thing, of course. People just went any, even when cars showed up, people just went any which way they wanted in the street. You know, people, horses, cars, carts, trolleys, right. just kind of mixing at random, you know. Right. It, 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 the reason I bring it up too is one of the things I talk to people a lot on the show and off the show. Uh, we will never see the kind of transformation people will often assert, like we would see from AI. We've never un undergone anything as radical, to which I always say, I think you just need to crack a history book. I mean, you don't know what that might have been like. I mean, that was their not AI specifically, but it's an analog to a world witnessing its entire um, center of gravity shifting. Um, yeah, AI, of course, depends on electricity. There yeah. was no electricity in the late nineteenth century. For most, I people. know you mentioned that how would it, you could look at the, the you know how the the lamps were burning at night in, in vast regions of the center of the country. There was no right, yeah. right, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, his birth town, Tampico, Illinois, was actually a little ahead of the curve. They generated their own electricity using the nearby Hennepin Canal to to you know spin a turbine and give them some electricity, which I can imagine was sort of a you know on and off sort of concept there. Of course, everybody had oil lamps too, because right. you can't really count on the electricity. Uh, so yeah. yeah, different world. Different, different world. world. I mean, and, and in the world we're in, so to give you a little bit of, of, of the background also of my interest in all things Reagan, I was born in 1974. And so I came of age during your dad's presidency. And of course, I was too young, obviously, to be able to wax eloquently about, you know, uh, you know, Latin American policy or the Contras or anything like that. However, um, growing up at the time I did in a democratic family, when at the time that I was, I was a Democrat until five years ago, I'm an independent now. Um, I have to say that your father's gauziness and his view of America and the self-confidence he made everybody feel 
and the optimism that we had in that period of people our age was really infectious. And he seemed like a leader, you know, and, and, and I don't say that to say he wasn't, but it really doesn't matter because that's what he appeared to be for people as, a, as citizens. I always say, you know, you relate to people for different reasons and he almost feels like the last great leader in my opinion. Um, and again, I, I, if I was a voting age in 1984, when I voted for him, I don't know. I mean, I don't know that, I, you know, I, I am no fan of Jimmy Carter, so I don't know I could have voted for him. Um, I, you know, Walter Mondale seemed like a perfectly lovely guy, but also hapless. I mean, I guess I bring this up to say that so much of my political um, education has been about, you know, people in a liberal environment just blaming every single thing on your father, which I think is, by the way, reductive and silly. I think you yourself have many disagreements ideologically with your father, but or did, but that does, I mean, you know, there's a sort of weird sense that history only began with the Reagan era, and here we are. Um, we're going to, of course, get into the to Orange Jesus, but, um, you know, how I know that you're a son, but I mean, do you know where I come from? How that how that affected people, almost in a nonpartisan way. I think that there's you can't put too much of a premium on that. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, I, yes, I disagree with many of his policies, particularly yeah. when you think about the environment and things like that. Um, some things we did see pretty much eye to eye on. Um, his approach, particularly at the end, uh, towards the Soviet Union, of yes. course, and Gorbachev, uh, you know, yeah. had the privilege of attending the Geneva summit uh, as, a, as a correspondent for Playboy magazine. Of all That's things. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, had some, I had some inside track, so I was able to actually get in the, <laughs> the room. By the way, for listeners, who, of our young listeners, yes, Playboy uh, was a, a incredible uh, uh, repository of great intellectual thinking and interviews. I mean, people even know what Playboy is. For those who are listening, it was not just a smut magazine. It had a lot of gravitas. No, it did. I mean, it, it had a good editorial section at that, at that point. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we, we disagreed a lot. Um, but the, the thing you had going for you with my father, um, whether you agreed or not with his policies, was that you could count on him being a pretty sterling character. Um, this yeah. was not a guy who, you know, went out of his way to lie to you. Uh, he was a decent human being, and uh, that's something we've, <laughs> we've, in recent years, have have gotten away from uh, in the presidency in a in a rather shocking uh, and frightening way. Um, and it doesn't seem to matter to a lot of people either, which is, yeah. which is, I, I like to I like to humanize things, and I and I yeah. like, let's say, journalists who also play that game. Because you can't separate the, the the office from the man. You might try. Yeah. Um, you might respect the office, but not respect the, the man. But they're occupying the same space, and uh, the character of the person. Um, they've all been men so far, but the character of the person in that office is important. Is very important. Um, you know, you can see it with a guy like Bill Clinton, who. Yeah. Uh, you know, very effective in many ways. Very. I like. I like this president. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, at a certain point, you begin to realize that okay, there are some character logical issues here that you know are a little troubling. And I'm not even just talking the kind of you know unfortunate age difference kind of you know president with the internet. It the lack of judgment that that you know demonstrated was just astonishing. Um, so anyway, I just mentioned that as a, as an aside, you know, that, that was, of course, nowadays that seems so sort of innocent and, and clean in a, in a way when you compare it to, to Donald Trump, the, the, yes, the orange turd. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I saw, I've seen it a few times. Um, and I, and I, and I don't know who you were speaking with cause I didn't recognize this person, but somebody made the outrageous leap on one of the YouTube shows that I saw. Uh, referencing your father and Trump and how you should be ba basically said something to you along the lines of, well, you know, you're a son of a famous Republican and Trump is now there and you should be in line. And you said something which was wonderful and you get my father's name out of your mouth. I don't know who this person was. I'm sure you've said it many times. It was great. I said, you and I aren't going to have that kind of interchange, but damn, that was good. But 
you know, it gives it gives me no pleasure as someone who is really nonpartisan. I really have, even through my life, I mean, I lived in New York for a long time. So, for example, I voted for George Pataki, always as governor. He was a sort of old-time Rockefeller Republican. I had no problem with that. I've never been on the left, per se, anyway, so it wasn't a huge leap. I am certainly not on the left now, uh, uh, but I'm not on the right either. And, again, those things – what's that? I'm on the left, so I balance you out. Yes, you do. I know you're on the left, which I love. But but I also think that those terms have come to mean different things. But the, the, it, I'm, I know that apart from, of course, being Ron Reagan Jr., it can't give you any, because um, I know it doesn't give me or anybody who's just a decent human being, any, um, I guess, any, any optimism almost. I don't know if that's the word, to have, to see that the Republican Party seems almost incapable of holding itself with, in, with any firm boundaries when it comes to the rule of law, uh, norms, our values, the constitution, and not just Trump, all of his coddlers, all of his enablers. And that is a huge, you know, for people who hate Republicans always, you know, do you really hate Lincoln and Grant and Eisenhower and Teddy Roosevelt and your dad? I mean, that's just, I'm sorry, that's not the same thing as Trump. And I know that that is a, obviously something you're probably asked about all the time, but it's something I just can't get over. Well, no, it, it, it's not Trump. Trump is sui generis. He's, yes, he he's never had a president like we've had presidents who had their issues, no, no doubt about it. Yeah. Nixon was, you know, a troubled guy. Yeah. Um, but a smart he, guy, though, with real policy prescriptions. Yes, but actually wanted to, to do yeah. something and, and thought about particularly foreign policy. Oh, yeah. A great deal was it was a real you know encyclopedia of, of you know, sort of local precincts and all of that too. He was a real politician's politician yeah. uh, at that point. I think we have trouble in this country, and it extends into the into the mainstream media a, a great deal. Um, simply recognizing what we're dealing with here, and that is certainly a sociopath, likely a psychopath. <laughs> Yeah. And I, I don't say that, you know, to, to call names. I mean, no, this no. is observable now. And I, and I say, you know, likely a psych, psychopathology, obviously that would require a real diagnosis. Sociate, sociopathology, on the other hand, is evident. It is in the way he behaves. You know, anybody with half a mind can observe that this man is clearly sociopathic. The way he treats his family. The way he treats people around him, the way he lies constantly, lies about things that are, you know, you remember his first day in office when he became obsessed with the crowd at his inauguration oh, and sent a you know, poor, you know, hapless Sean Spicer out to, to you know, defend the, the notion that he had the biggest crowd that had ever assembled in Washington. When you've got aerial photographs demonstrating conclusively that's not true, as if it matters anyway. But, you know, it, it's this kind of stuff, but we have trouble, I think, in this country just calling a spade a spade sometimes. You know, that it seems pejorative. Well, I guess it is, but it's also realistic. Right. You know, the man's a sociopath. He's a danger to our He tried to overthrow the government. You know, you know never should be forgotten. In fact, we all watched it happen on television. And he's saying he'll do it again. You know, so <laughs> when do we just say enough? Uh, yeah, I mean, one of the things, enough. Yes, I mean, I can't believe we're going through Trump 3.0 here or the attempt. Yeah, because the Republican Party will not say to him, enough, leave. We don't want you anymore. No, no, they, they're saying, you know, they know his base is their base, potentially. And without him, they're like, you know, they can get primaried. And the only thing that matters to somebody like Marco Rubio or Lindsey Graham is that he can show up on Meet the Press on Sunday. You know, without that, they, they cease to exist, apparently. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it's a sad thing. The roots of this extend quite far back, though. I mean, you go to Nixon and you've got the Southern yeah. strategy. Yeah. You know, and frankly, you go back farther than that. You've got, you know, the, the opposition to the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King, and all that. You've got Goldwater and yeah. people like that. But it, it progressed. And, you know, eventually you get into the 90s and it's Newt Gingrich, who now yeah. weaponizes, who, who starts the they're the enemy kind of thing. But that sentiment was there even earlier, even before Newt Gingrich sort of said it out loud. I remember people, not my father himself, and not most of the people who were around,
around him, but there were some of the more hardcore people that worked in his campaigns who really you, you understood that their sentiment was, if we lose, it's not legitimate. Yeah. Democrats cannot be the right. legitimate governing party, just by their very nature. Right. Um, and you know, now nobody was saying, so we should, you know, not, we should, we should oppose a peaceful transfer of power. But there was just this vibe of we're the only ones who ought to be in charge. You know, screw the elections. It's, uh, you know, we're the rightful owners of the White House, basically. Um, and that, that has now transmogrified, of course, with Trump into something far darker um, and more defined, shall we say. Yeah. I mean, I think that um, the, the, the MAGA movement, which has come to manifest the idea that policies don't matter, mm -hmm. right? And it, to the extent they matter, and this is another problem, because I don't, when I say that, I want to qualify it by saying, I, you know, the dissent of the, for me, ideologically, it's the dissent of the Republican Party into, into sort of this weird quasi- we like big government, sometimes angry populism, borrowing now protectionist policies from the left, uh, aiding and abetting tyrants when it suits them, um, and not in the ways presidents used to. You know, we always, you know, we, we, we the United States wanted Pinochet and Somoza and these people, I know, and the Shah, yes. But, you know, Gene Kirkpatrick rightly argued that some dictatorships are better than others, and that's a different argument for a different show. But He's now, our son of a bitch. Was our bitch. son of a bitch, yeah. And I think that's right. And I think sometimes U.S. interests, it's in geopolitics is sorted, to say the least. Mm -hmm. But now, it's there's no governing philosophy. But one of the things that is prevailing, to the point of what you probably noted in some of the hard righties back in the day, was own the libs. Mm -hmm. anything, that, anything that they say has to be so bad that we'll oppose it. So if that means getting in bed with Vladimir Putin, we'll oh. do it. Yeah. Getting in bed with Viktor Orban, will yeah. do. Look how upset all those thoughtful people are when we, right. when, when we do something like this. You right. Know, when you know. we march through Charlotte with you know signs saying that Jews will not replace us, look how upset those liberals get at that, things like that. Yeah, right. I, I, I I never feel owned <laughs> no. by the MAGA people. I feel contemptuous of them. I feel sometimes confused as to. Are these people who seem so dim <laughs> that they can't see through the guy who's right in front of them? But it becomes tribal, as you pointed out. That's the owning the lips part. It's just if they're for it, we're against it. You know, yeah. that's it. But the other the other thing, the other abandonment though, that I think I that I really believe, and maybe this was sort of when I was, you know, feeling attached a bit to the Reagan era and uh, being a Cold War kid, but also, the idea that we are absolutely going to throw away the idea of peace through strength. Okay, we are not going to. We're not going to govern that way. Okay, we're going to govern by deciding who, right, is putting forth not peace through strength. Let me add something. Not peace through strength as a philosophy for the United States as a bulwark of defense and smart geopolitics. Not only are we getting rid of that. We're going to go with Viktor Orban and other people because their attacks on LGBT people or whatever that may be, that'd be good. That would be a good blueprint. Yes. So we're not only going to get in bed and cozy up, we're going to be kind of our own American autocracy, right? Mm -hmm. And we're going to we're going to do away, you know, with all the great achievements of, and again, we're in a very different place with Russia, but of what the Cold War represented, you know, that, that you know, democracy and... and freedom and liberalism as in a classical sense, I think is the, the best way. I mean, I, I really do believe that. I think that there's really been no alternative, which Churchill always says it's the worst, least form of government, whatever the quote is. But except all the others. Yeah. Yes, except that is true. I don't think that anybody's pining. I think today's campus left might be, but I don't think anybody's pining for communism. I mean, they're not anyone who's lived under it. So, you know, you know, and that, that, again, that doesn't mean, you know, we have nuance in this show. That doesn't mean that social programs shouldn't exist and the government should die. I mean, that's, that's also, but that, but MAGA doesn't believe that. Trump isn't running on really gutting the social safety net. He's running on hardcore social policy and nativism and fear and deportation. It's not really, it's not, the sun in Ronald Reagan's face has been completely obscured by some very dark clouds. 
Yeah, yeah, that, that's true. I, I think, too, that this whole notion of now of conservatism and liberalism left and right has, has become kind of pointless, not just yeah. because of Trump, but I think it's those terms, while, you know, we can agree that, well, okay, you know, liberal means this and conservative means that on, I don't know, taxes or, or something like, like that. You know, what does it really mean to be, for instance, I, you know, I spent half my time in, in Europe and in, in Italy where, you know, all the countries have universal health care. Yeah. Or does that make them leftist or liberal? Right. Or does right. it make us the only developed country on earth that does not provide health care to its citizens? Just kind of a weird outlier. You know, it's not conservative yeah. or liberal. It's just kind of dumb. Yeah. <laughs> You know, but and there there are you know other things about that. Is it is it conservative or liberal to be concerned about climate change? Right, uh, kind of realistic. It seems to me we're talking about science, physics, yeah. things like that. I I don't know that that you know maybe nature has a liberal bias this week. Right, but uh, you know so I, I I don't find those terms all that useful anymore. Uh, but I will say that uh, you mentioned Viktor Orban. Of course, there's Trump's good friend, Vladimir Putin, and, and all of that. You know, we're, aside from climate change, which is an existential threat to the human race, not the yeah. planet, by the way, that'll, that'll go on, but yeah. the human race, the other real challenge we have is authoritarianism versus democracy. Yeah. Um, and authoritarianism is a lot easier um, than, than democracy. Democracy is very new. Authoritarianism, very old. Um, Democracy. We we weren't really a full democracy here in the United States until the nineteen sixties and the Voting Rights Act. Yeah, you and know? I was I was going to segue with that uh, an important thing which I know we can unpack. So, well, first of all, you obviously, as you know, and as a guess, it was it was the last sort of um, stand of that party of Lincoln. But you wouldn't have a Civil Rights Act or Voting Rights Act without the Republican Party. Yes, LBG, LBJ signed it, but not with the help of Southern Democrats, which historically were the party of white supremacy. And that obviously switched, we know. Um, and uh, a young Gerald Ford was a congressman, a young Bob Dole, all voted for civil rights of 64, voting rights of 65, fair housing of 68. That's what you did in lily white districts. I mean, Russell, Kansas, I don't think had any black people. I think they had one Jewish family, and it was the Specter family, I think, from what I understand. But so it's this, this is not like some haven of leftism, right? Um, however, one of the things that I'm always, and, and, and you know, maybe I have, maybe I've got a bias towards your dad. I know he was against at the time the Civil Rights Act, and yeah. from kind of, but, but, but in a way that Goldwater was, I don't agree with it. However, there was this sort of states' rights idea of the government. Not, but don't put the government in, in the way of what people can do. I, this is what I ask you, your dad, based on what you've written and based on everything I know, I mean, wasn't that just a kind of, I don't know, naivete on his part of where we were? Not a bone deep racism. I, I mean, I, 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 I would, no. I, I, ne I never heard him use any racial epithet. No. no. Very upset if he heard any of his children uh, yeah. use something like that. But I think, too, along with that, you know, having grown up in the horse and buggy era, you have to realize that, you know, through well into the 70s, actually, and certainly in the, you know, in the early 60s, uh, white people in America, uh, in a decisive majority, whatever they thought about civil rights and legal rights and things like that, generally speaking, did not think that they were the same as black people. Right, of course. 72% uh, of people in the early 60s said that if they, uh, if black families moved into their, their neighborhood, they would want to move. Right. 72% of white people, oh, yeah. almost three quarters, said they would move if, you know, several black families moved into their neighborhood. Um, you know, so it was a different time. And I, I think we... You know, we sometimes misjudge history because we look at it through the lens of the, of the present and our, yeah. our present sensibilities. But back then, I, I mean, back then on television or in movies or in public, you could make fun of gay people. Oh, well, that's 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 only changed recently. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was no big deal. The American Psychiatric Society still listed it as a disorder. 
you know, and so they, fair game. The the epithets and the you know the stereotypical kind of uh, kind of stuff. So this is all pretty new. But like democracy, this this is all very new, and it's very fragile. I mean, democracy requires. You remember the famous uh, you know thing about do we have a monarchy or democracy? And you know it, it's a democracy if you can keep it. Um, right. It's you know it requires an informed citizenry. Yeah. It requires us to to acknowledge that, that that our opponents won, and we're okay with that. We're not happy, maybe, but hey, you won fair and square, so we'll get you next time. You know, here's the key to the Oval Office. Here's the you know, and that's not that's not human nature. You know, human nature is yeah, but I want to win. <laughs> you oh, know, yeah. well, I, I want to win. Well, I think, and I think wanting to win, and I listen, politicians are politicians, you know, and I think it's interesting because I think your dad dually believed in America as an idea very much, but also wanted to win. And you, you talk in the book about that painful moment when he's barely edged out by Gerald Ford in 76 um, and, you know, how he went to the podium and, you know, just he wasn't happy having been a winner, you know, and, and understandably uh, coming from that place. But... I also know that, and I couldn't find out, I couldn't find where it was, but in the early 80s at some point, Bill Sapphire, then at the New York Times, famously a Nixon speechwriter, said that Reagan had turned to a group of his advisors in the first term vis-a-vis -vis the religious right, which he had, well, well, actually Carter really brought them in, but he capitalized on it, you know, and said, we'll jolly them along. You know, he was never going to do stuff the religious stuff again some of you you know liberals will make and say oh he aided and abetted all this and yes and no i mean you know what i mean he certainly wasn't going to overturn roe v wade i mean the school prayer amendment died it, a lot of it was window dressing you know and he was largely pro-choice as governor of california i mean was this was this reagan the politician i mean was he really at heart i mean yes he was a conservative but in a in a kind of old-fashioned small c way not a religious yeah. conservative well, he, you know, he, he was you know that information, jolly them along. Have you heard that before? Have you? The, the, word, the phrase jolly them along. No, 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 no. Bill Sapphire is. Exp I, 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 I didn't remember that from, yeah. from Bill Sapphire, but, but he's not wrong about yeah. that. I mean, my, my father personally was, was anti-choice, but, you know, never came up really in his life. No. And uh, he understood, I think, that both his wife and her mother uh, would have been, might have torn him a new one if he'd been a little too actively anti-choice. Wasn't your mother, like many Republican first ladies, pro-choice, didn't sit? Well, oh, I was? think, yes, in her, in her heart of hearts, she would have been pro-choice. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, as would, certainly would her mother have been, who was a Edie, who was a real pistol. <laughs> she and my father used to swap dirty jokes all the time. And, you know, so, so yes, probably, you know, in his heart, he didn't, yeah. abortion made him squeamish and understandably, yeah. that's fine. Um, but he was yeah. not going to go out and get on a soapbox about it. That, that just, that kind of social issue stuff, the, the, you know, anti-gay. No. Like, it just, he had gay friends. It was just, yeah. 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 I'd say. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, I mean, yeah. would pan, but yes, would pander at times to, to those people, uh, would say things that they wanted to hear, even if he wasn't going to do anything that they wanted him to do exactly. He would make them, make them think that, you know, he was on their side when really he was only sort of half on their side. Um, right. There is a wonderful new book out. Uh, by a guy uh, who's a professor now at UF, he used to be at Texas, uh, called uh, The Peacemaker, how Ronald Reagan, it's not how Ronald Reagan won the Cold War, it is called, sorry, uh, anyway, it's called The Peacemaker. He had him, I had him on the show. Mm -hmm. And to the point of Ronald Reagan being a very shrewd operator, obviously mm -hmm. he's the ardent anti-communist, you know, he, he, he runs on that, you know, America's... Uh, feeling about itself post-Vietnam and Watergate and the Soviet Union's creeping aggression, though he knew it was kind of a paper tiger, you know, it was part of his whole thing. And the book argues that though he came into office as a, you know, but in the evil empire to the ash heap of history and all that stuff, you know, 
he ended up being quite the diplomat. A, as you write about in the book, he was, in, and I don't think conservatives in any, or whoever they are, uh, whatever these conservatives call themselves today, have any idea how committed he was to the abolition of nuclear weapons and how much diplomacy took place and where he, he really became a statesman. And if he was, he already was, but he used the, the peacemaker, Ronald Reagan, the Cold War and the World on the Brink. That's what it's called by William Inboden. He's on the show. You should listen to it. Penguin published it. He, um, Reagan had that ability, you know, and then again, earned the ire of the right at the time. Bill Buckley and all his friends. Said, How could you do this? A lot like Nixon did when he went and changed the world, I think, for the better by meeting with Mao. You right. know, how Reagan is placing a little bit of Reagan's ability to, you know, fool you a little bit. The wink and the nod made you believe he was just, you know, simpler than he really was. Yeah, um, <clears throat> he uh, he was he was somewhat naive in, in in some respects, and he also had a very kind of you know I'll use the word childlike, and I don't mean it in a in a pejorative way. A view of the world in that, just like a child might say, "Well, boy, you know, we've all got these big bombs that can destroy the planet. Maybe we should get rid of them." You know, well. Yeah, <laughs> that, that would be a good idea if you, if you could do it, but at least reduce their number uh, tremendously. And he was kind of obsessed with this for quite some time back in 76 when he got up, having lost to Ford at the convention. What is the crux of his remarks? Driving down the, the coast of California, the time capsule that you know, he's participated in. When it's open, we will know whether we have succeeded and saving the world from nuclear holocaust. So this was on his mind even back in 76. By the time he gets to the White House and can actually do something about it, well, there's a lot of other stuff going on in the first term, but second term comes, and you know, a succession of Soviet leaders, have, as he said, died on me. <laughs> you know, he, there was nobody to yeah. talk three and Three died, right? Brezhnev, Andropov, and Chalenko, right? Sure. Yeah, they all died. In the, in the first four years of his administration, boom, 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 they all go. Uh, so nobody, again, a lot of chaos over there and nobody to talk to. But then along comes Gorbachev, who, you know, has a very sophisticated sense of what's going on, obviously, in the Soviet Union, um, and realizes that economically they just can't do this, you know, anymore. Changes need to be made, fundamental changes. And, uh, and my father perceives that this is a guy I can actually deal with. And we could actually, you know, reduce the number of nuclear weapons. And they did, uh, first time that it had happened. So that's, you know, you got to like that. <laughs> oh, sure. I mean, I, I mean, and, and again, I think that we saw, and you mentioned Newt Gingrich, you know, as it relates to the Reagan era too, again, because it's I, a time of my life I've lived in. Well, that makes no sense what I just said. I, I lived through this. So I mean, and I was younger, but where I am now and being a student of this my whole life, you know, there was a hardening of politics in the Gingrich era and beyond. And not to suggest that Reagan didn't bring in some crazies, but 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 you know, the the scorched earth policy, right, of a Gingrich who was a backbencher, giving speeches to an empty house of representatives, carrying on about a um, McGovern communist government and all this crazy stuff, um, you know, really hardened in the 90s, you know, where, where policies, uh, some of which were borrowed from Reagan, but also, again, coalesced around, we're angry we've been out of power, so we're going to implement the following things. Mm -hmm. And Bill Clinton got elected. How dare he? Because it was 12 years of Republican rule in the White House. And we, we thought we'd never see that again because we thought Jimmy Carter was the last Democratic president. At least that was the prevailing idea. You know, and then it, in comes in Bill Clinton with two big term, big wins, you know, winning the South again and winning Ohio and Missouri. I mean, and Montana. I mean, it's unbelievable, this electoral map. It's literally another era, you know. And they were, you know, uh, more than chafing at it. And with that came a caustic nature that I think uh, you see go all the way, all the way through to Trump, um, mm -hmm. you know, and that, but what, how about the fact though, Ron, that the, the, the deep, I mean, you could even call it, I mean, books were full of hagiography, which I've written to this like uh, obsessive veneration, maybe is the word or the term for your dad, which was like, you could never say a bad word about Ronald Reagan. And now 
It's Donald mm-hmm. Trump. I mean, that's you saying Reagan. It's like, well, that was oh, that was yesterday. Reagan is yesterday. You know, we don't. That's not what we're talking about anymore. Mm-hmm. Isn't that in your lifetime? I mean, I know um, you probably thought some of that veneration was obscene, but I mean, you know, now it, it, it's it's like to invoke Reagan is well, the left loves to invoke him because they said it's all his fault. Every last thing. And the right doesn't view him as particularly uh, important <laughs> in their movement, at least now. Well, he, he isn't now. I yeah. mean, you know, he, he would have nothing to do with today's Republican Party. He was no. just, I, I mean, who are these people after these spineless, simpering, you know, people? How, how lacking in dignity and self-respect do you have to be? to troop down to Mar-a-Lago or to a courtroom in Manhattan and smooch Donald Trump's ass. I mean, really, have you no pride, no self-respect whatsoever? These are people, too, that have been insulted terribly by him. Sometimes their spouses being their wives. Oh, yeah. you, know, you know, Ted Cruz and his wife. I mean, you know... Not that I really care what Donald Trump has to say about me or you know, anything else, frankly. You know, don't Does he attack you? Donald Trump attack you? No, I don't think so. But I, I if he did, I why yeah. would I even no. care? At the same time, it's a matter of principle. You're running against the guy in a, in a political race and he goes after your wife in really personal terms. Right. I mean, I, I gotta say, the next time we were on stage at a debate, he ends up on his ass. You know, I mean, sorry, you don't do that. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I got into a discussion. I got into a discussion, and there's obviously wonderful clips from your dad with the Immigration Reform Act of 86 and giving amnesty to people that had come here. I grew up in Miami, uh, so obviously very um, huge Latino and specifically Cuban-American community, but not exclusively people who had revered Reagan because they got their citizenship under him and, and, you know, believed in his view of whoever wants to come here and, and call this city on a hill its home. That would be great. And I got into a squabble with somebody. It was a couple of years ago um, about what Reagan said about immigration because I, I do believe we have a separate show. We have to deal with asylum law and, and the border policy is a disaster, but not because I'm not for immigration. I mean, in other words, I'm not approaching it from a nativist, xenophobic point of view. They okay. could not believe I sent them this clip and said, it's not the same thing. And Reagan sold the country out. This is a MAGA person or a Trump person. They were officially MAGA. And mm-hmm. immigration is a disaster. And, you know, and so the entire creedal idea that your father did subscribe to, bye, because mm-hmm. we're angry now or because told us to hate people or or we're just so pissed off that i mean by the way this person wasn't even from a border state anyway but anyway so interesting right? this great replacement theory stuff that people like right. tucker carlson were peddling on you know on fox and, and others yeah. of course as well that there's some deliberate plot by democrats to have a bunch of people from south of the border come here illegally and then somehow vote you know, to take, and George Soros, of course, is inevitably involved in this because you got to get some anti Semitism in there too when you're these folks. You're going to be a homophobe, you're going to be a misogynist, you're going to be a racist, but it's no fun unless you also get the anti Semitism in there too. You right. Know? Yeah. Well, yeah, George, you know- for some weird reason, wants to move a bunch of Hispanics into America, have them vote for. Joe Biden, I, I guess, and then do what? <laughs> you know, what? What? Speaking, the- I, and listen, I know I can count on you for your honest commentary, and I obviously you are on the left. I like that. Um, as I said, I don't know where I am because I'm politically homeless. I'm just not on the left, so I'm going to be in my uh, homeless encampment out here somewhere. Uh, we're looking at a, another fateful election, and we hear this all the. Not that it's. I mean, it doesn't, it sounds like hyperbole, but it isn't yet another existential election. This is the most important election of our lifetime. I feel like we say this every four years, but it is true. This time it's really true. Yeah. It's really true. So obviously, look, we, you know, I'm a never Trumper, so I'm voting for Biden. I'm not, I think Joe Biden is a very weak president for a number of reasons, but I don't care. Um, it, I, I don't have a, what's that? You've gotten a few things done. You know, sure. Got, you uh, to, yeah. Got, you know. <laughs> Climate stuff. It's you know. Sure. You- I mean, I don't believe that. I I think I think he's passed a lot of excessive spending in bills that I don't think will do very much. I think his performance on the world stage is very weak. But it's okay. I voted for him. I'm gonna vote for him again. NATO together for Ukraine. He that- did. Do, he did. He did. 
Gaza and, and Netanyahu, there's that's a no-win situation there. Well, I, I, I for you know what? No, 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 no. I don't. It's not that I blame Biden. I, I just think Biden and his team um, are. Um, I, I don't like Anthony Blinken. I just think it's a naive group of people. That's okay. I have a disagreement on their policies, on their view. Um, I, I, I would take Ronald Reagan any day. I mean, please, I, 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 this crowd is is lost, but yeah. I'm voting for them. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, so the alternative is what? The crazy guy. And I like Joe Biden personally. I do think. Oh, he is. Oh, yes. He's a decent man. I do think he's too old. Trump is too old, too. I'm not he's saying that. Right. Too old. There's nothing you can do about that. If I Really, if I have to hear about Biden's age one more time, I'm well, really- I, I'm just reflecting how good people are viewing it again. I'm not, I don't, you and I don't represent the average voter who's going to go decide this election. Because we're not if, on the fence. As long as when, when you say Biden is too old, you also add, and Trump is insane. Trump is a mental patient. I say it. My show is a never try. So I, the guy who's a little too old or the guy who really yeah. is in a rubber room. I mean, Listen, I, I, Ron, I have 150 episodes talking about, you know, rubbing sandpaper on my eye, you know, and, and <laughs> before I vote for Donald Trump. There's not even a debate about it. Yeah. By the way, it's, and I did like to give Biden for the, the Biden. I did like chips and science and the infrastructure bill. So there's things I liked. I'm in the middle. I mean, I just, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not on board with everything. Okay. But that's okay. We don't have to agree. By the way, this is my thing about your dad. When I say to liberals, you don't have to agree with every single thing he did, but to say the entire legacy, you know, it's, but most presidents, most, you know, uh, maybe Andrew Johnson, Donald Trump, James Buchanan, most presidents have a legacy where you can point to some very good things and some things that, you know, uh, didn't go so well. You know, I, 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 you know, I think there were pro- a lot of problems in your father's second term, obviously. We now know that, that he was not, this is a contra thing was a disaster and no question. And, or there's, there's lying us into a war we didn't need to fight, George W. Bush. Oh, then, yeah. then torturing captives, which didn't you well, I, I, I'm not a fan. Listen, I'm not a fan of George W. Bush. I have never voted in my lifetime. As I said, for a Republican in the nat for the presidency, I've not had the opportunity to. I've never found anybody that I thought, you know, in, in the choices that I make. Again, I was a Democrat, but I said, you know, again, I never liked, for example, I've never liked John Kerry particularly. I find him to be pompous and smug and ineffective. I voted for him. You know, I certainly voted for Al Gore. I like Bill Clinton was my favorite Democrat. I voted for Barack Obama twice. I think his second term in rhetoric was really problematic. And I think he's deeply overrated in, in retrospect. But I voted for him. History was judge. Yes. I voted for him. I mean, that's the thing. People, you know, I anger my progressive friends, but I'm still voting with them half the time. So they can't get that <laughs> they can't get that angry at me. Yeah, but, I'm gonna vote for this guy. You know. Well, I mean, like I like and then now there was no way I was voting for Donald Trump, you know, in either time. So in this election, I know you don't really do punditry because you're deeper and better than that. But do you don't you have fears though that Trump could win again? I mean, that's not an unfounded fear. Yeah, no, it's, it, it's not because of our electoral college system. He's never win the, the popular vote. But consider that the first time around, Hillary Clinton wins by close to three million votes in the popular vote. Donald Trump gets, I think it was 306 electoral college votes. Right. Yeah. I believe that was the... the, the yeah, right on the nose. Yeah. Loses, not the 49 states your dad won. <laughs> so loses by three million gets the 306 electoral votes for, for the victory. Along comes Biden, wins by 7 million, and gets 306 electoral votes. Right. You know, so there's a 10 million you know, swing there. This is yeah. a built-in advantage, seems to me, for, for Republicans. And it really only comes down to this handful of states and, and you know some tens of thousands of voters. So, you know, if... I don't know, black voters are a little, you know, upset because things aren't going, you know, the way they think it should be. Or young voters, you know, who are all twisted up about Gaza decide that it's all Joe Biden's fault. And I, I'll tell you what, I'm not going to vote for him. That'll show everybody, you know, and you get to end up with Trump. Why? You think Trump is going to be, you know, better with Gaza? Is he not just going to say to Netanyahu, you do whatever you want to do? You know, Netanyahu is one of his kind of guys, you know, a corrupt autocrat. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I don't know, 
you know, it, it could go it could go south is what I'm saying. He could, in fact, win again in the Electoral College, and that would be a disaster for this country. You know, what's going to happen in Ukraine? Mm, I, I bet Vladimir Putin rolls right over Ukraine at that point. Um, yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, the other thing I always say to people, well, first of all, presidents don't control gas prices. And, and, and there's a lot of, you know, energy is a global thing too, even though we actually are the largest, we are a net exporter of oil now for the first time. And natural gas. Largest right. And I've defended uh, Biden on that from the right saying, you guys are just talking, your talking points just don't fly. I mean, they fly for your cult, but they don't fly. But that being said, you know, I, I think people, and I, I don't like when any, I, what I don't like about our, where I think our politics gets childish too, and really bothers me is then when the left, if, the, if the, there's a good economy under Trump, oh, well, that's not his doing. Okay, well, you can't have it both ways. Either presidents have an impact or they don't have an impact. That being said, the mm -hmm. idea that people think that Trump getting elected just on a trans or on a, on a, on a basic legislative level is going to lower your inflation and lower your gas. I mean, it's such a, it's so, it's, 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 congenitally stupid. Well, it is. It, it, he certainly raised our debt with his oh, big sure. 83 percent yeah. of which went to the top 1%. Right. And you wonder about all these working class blue collar folks in the, in the Rust Belt who are talking about that, you know, they got a tax cut on Trump. Yeah. Well, what was it? A penny or two? Mm -hmm. off your, you, know, you, think? you know, who really got a tax cut was the Jeff Bezos and, you know, Elon Musk's of the world. They got a real big tax cut. Um, and why these people don't understand that and see that, I guess they're just not paying attention. And it doesn't really matter. You know, if I say that to them, if I repeat this, it's a lie. It's not true. Right. You're just one of the elite. You're in the other tribe. And we don't believe anything you say. Um, and, you know, I, this, this country is coming apart. Yes. Uh, like it hasn't since the Civil War. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we're not going to have a civil war like we did back then. Right. But I, you know, no matter what happens in this election, I think there's going to be violence uh, afterwards. Certainly if Trump loses, you know, we, we've seen that act before. Um, but if he wins, you know, he's going to start doing things that there and people on the left are really going to object to. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. Well, listen, January 6th alone, even if I had supported him, I absolutely did not as is unforgivable. I mean, it was your father who famously said the four-year transfer of power is a miracle. You know, it, it is. Yeah, it is that we've been able to do this, but for Trump for yeah. 240 years or 35 years, you know, that it it's amazing. I, I want to uh, switch gears for a second now up to all things Reagan. So your sister has now written a few editorials for the New York, which is a book coming out, but she's uh, spoke out against sort of the cruelty and the, the scorched earth nature of this country. And, and it's obviously, um, I think she was, she always was, always think she was really never a Republican. Was she? I don't think so. I mean, think either of us were. neither of you were, are you guys, what's going on in the Reagan world? Like how's Patty doing? What's, how's everything? She's fine. She just wishes my birthday today. So she wished me. Today's your birthday? It is. You um, buried the lead. Happy <laughs> birthday. Come on, Ron. So she's, she's doing fine. Yes, she's got a, a new book out. I uh, yeah. so, uh, Congratulations for that. And I saw a couple of pieces in the New York Times uh, recently on the op-ed uh, page. Yeah, she's, uh, you know, like me, she's, you know, disgusted with today's Republican Party. She would be, you know, even if we weren't the children of the father we are. Um, but, uh, yeah, so she's speaking out for that and, and good for her. Yeah. Right. And did... Um, were you solo in your, I think you were, in, in the writing of your book, when you went to Tampa Go and you learned about sure. Nellie and Jack, you did that all alone, right? You never went with family members or you, you yeah. I mean, did, was that, that must've been such a um, catharsis in a lot of ways for your siblings, right? Um, well, it was interesting, of course, <laughs> unfortunately, my brother, <laughs> Mike, <laughs> takes a, a dim view of anything that I do. So, I, and he was very critical of parts of it. But are you into? Do you talk to Michael? Is that? Oh no, we don't. He, no, he does not want to actually address these issues that he thinks he has with me directly because I think he knows how that would go. So, uh, he, so is he defending Trump? I don't follow him. 
No, I don't think he does. He's he's uh, had some health issues recently, I, I believe, and so he's not really doing a lot as far as far as I know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he was uh, at the time the book came out. He decided that he would claim that I said that my father was suffering from Alzheimer's dementia while he was in office, and that many of his decisions were really as a result of being non compass mentis. And, and in fact, I said the opposite. Yeah, that's not what the book says at all. But uh, by the way, if I can point to this, not to in invade the family squabble here, I think that has that goes back to what I'm saying in an era where the book came out, right? With with that obsession generation of all things Reagan, he's the son of Ronald Reagan, you know, it was more about you uh, saying anything, but he, he misrepresented what you said, but you criticizing anything would be, it would be blasphemy. You know, it was, an, it was a sort of own the anti-Reagan view in that time. You know? Yeah. I mean, it, you know, in, in my case, he would, have, he would have just found something else to complain about. And, you know, the, the <laughs> fact is you know, I, I was simply in, in a sentence or two just acknowledged scientific reality. Dr. Ronald Peterson at the Mayo Clinic had done a study uh, around that a little while before I, I did the book, which uh, proved that Alzheimer's disease, you, you and I could have Alzheimer's right now. Yeah. Um, the, the disease takes at least a decade or so to develop to the point where you get uh, dementia and it becomes observable and that's usually when somebody is 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 diagnosed in late stage Alzheimer's uh, early stage moves much faster but um, but in late stage Alzheimer's 10 maybe even 20 years so Dr. Ronald Peterson was also my father's neurologist mm -hmm. so you know I was merely stating the the prevailing scientific medical wisdom at the yeah. time that, that of course he must have had the disease when he was in office, but nobody saw any signs of dementia. That was later, some five years, four or five years after he left office, um, which makes sense on the usual Alzheimer's uh, timeline. But that was easily misconstrued by somebody who wanted to misconstrue. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. What was the most... Um of your grandparents, what was the most, when you did all this research, what do you think the most revealing thing was about Jack and Nellie? I mean, you write so beautifully about so much, and I really want people to read this book. For those that don't, though, I want them to get a little bit more of a sense of what that was. My, my grandfather, uh, Jack Reagan, has always been described as an alcoholic, and it, it's certainly true that he, he drank at, at times um, and got himself in trouble drinking, uh, lost jobs because of it. Uh, but then he would go long periods of time when he, he didn't drink. I'm not sure that he was actually an alcoholic as mm. such. Uh, you know, again, remember back then, people drank a lot. <laughs> Men in oh, yeah. drank a lot. You know that I heard a, 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 a piece of history I never knew, speaking of drinking, that a lot of the reason of prohibition was that men were so often beating their wives I mean, in other words, it came out of this sort of Jane Addams-y, you know, sobriety, puritanical thing. That, that there was so much domestic violence that it was like, we have to stop legally selling alcohol. I never knew that. Uh, yeah, I, I hadn't heard that particularly no. either, but, uh, you know, I believe it. Not that's what your grandfather was doing, but I'm saying that was a reason alcoholism was attacked. Yeah, I, and I mean, even when I was a kid, there was still the three martini lunch. Oh, sure. Yeah. The guy in the gray flannel suit, you go to lunch and get drunk, basically. Come back. I don't know how people go to work all day and get drunk. I never understood it. Even I don't care what era it was. I don't get that. <laughs> I, don't, I didn't get it either. So so that the alcoholism thing, I think, was what was interesting, too, was that, you know, my father would tell stories about his father. The one famous story when he's coming home as a he has it about a 10 year old boy and sees his father passed out on the front stoop of their house in full view of the neighborhood. Hmm. And it's a, you know, it's a chilly day and, you know, he's sort of the breath is, you know, he's belching up the whiskey breath and, you know, this cloud of vapor uh, there. And my father has, he tells the story where he kind of grabs Jack by the Jack and hauls him into the, the house and then kind of gets him up the stairs and, and puts him to bed. And of course, says nothing to his mother uh, when she comes home. I went to the house. I looked at the staircase. Um, I noted that my father at age 10 was a little guy. He was undersized at that age. Jack was a pretty burly fella. He didn't 
pull him in. He didn't drag him up the stairs or anything like that. Jack probably got to his feet and staggered up, cursing, <laughs> staggered up the stairs on his own. But that left Jack being a little bit too much of a character in the story that my father wanted to tell. That story was about my dad and his coming of age and realizing that he had to take responsibility for his drunken father at that point. And so Jack needed to be, in a sense, written out of the story. He needed to be turned into an object and not a subject in that story. And those kinds of things were, uh, were interesting to me. Um, my conclusion was that my father's character was largely forged, not in college, not on the football field, but on the, uh, the riverbanks of the Rock River, where he was a lifeguard for seven years, uh, saved 77 people, starting when he was 15 years old. You know, uh, so 11 per summer would be about uh, about the average. Uh, right. there. We think about this is this was starting at age 15. He was diving into a river and pulling grown men, some of whom bigger and stronger than he was, for sure, uh, out of that river over and over again. You know, probably once a week he would he would do this. This is how he sort of grew up as a teenager. Yeah. You remember being a teenager. Not sure how, you know. How I never, I'm so, not because I lacked for heroism. I just didn't experience that. I didn't have an opportunity to. I mean, yeah, I. By the time he graduates from college, he saved 77 lives. You know, that's got to do something to you. I also was particularly moved back to um, the fraught subject of race relations in America, and they're always fraught, was. Um, you know, him ask, bringing the two uh, teammates who were black back to the yeah. house. They couldn't stay at the hotel. Right. I know you. I know that you mentioned or someone mentioned in the book, of course, it doesn't let the hotel clerk off the hook. Uh -huh. and it doesn't. But but again, we're looking at a time through history that it's not again about excusing it. We have to see it for what it was. Mm -hmm. That being said, he came in the house. Your father didn't even, didn't even uh, blanch. Well, I mean, the, father, excuse me. that was interesting to me because, you know, how did he not know that the hotel wouldn't take the black players? He grew up in this town. You know, this was Dixon. This was his his town uh, that they were stopping in. Yeah. So <clears throat> how is it that he didn't know? But then his impulse also to try and make this OK. Yeah. I mean, uh, the best thing I put on it, excuse me a sec. Sure. Mm -hmm. Best that I put on it is that he realized that uh, if he did what the coach wanted him to do, which having found out that they could not stay in any hotel uh, in the in town, right, then we'll sleep on the bus, right. I, I imagine my father would have thought, well, if we go back and, and we sleep on the bus, all of yeah. us, the two black guys are going to know why. <laughs> yeah, we're not fooling them. And so he thought maybe this will make it better for everybody um, if I just take them home because I know I can do that. I'll just take them to my folks' house. It's right there, and uh, they they won't mind, you know. And indeed, they didn't. There was no questions asked there. It was black, white, whatever it didn't matter to Mel, Nellie, and Jack. Um, so there you were. But it but it did, and continued in the telling later on. Elide the, the the fact that that Dixon was a town that you know had the Klan in it and and that was racist. Oh yeah. And, you know his brother's best friend was black, and they used to go to the movies together. But Moon, his my father's brother, used yeah. to have to sit up in the balcony because that's the only place black people were allowed to sit in the theater. Yeah. Well, so everybody knows that this is what's going on here. Yeah. You know, yeah. No, it's, I mean, it's, it, the stories are, they're beautiful a lot of ways and explain, it made me think of, um, of Gerald, young Gerald Ford when he was a player at University of Michigan. There was a great biography came out last year uh, by Richard Norton Smith called An Ordinary Man. We also had him on the show because I love presidential history. And he took up for the only black player on the team. Mm -hmm. it, for Ford, it was, you know, being a Grand Rapids, Michigan guy, being in the party of Lincoln and, and saying, this is wrong. Mm -hmm. And it, they're almost so there's almost something quaint about it, given where Republican politics went. But that's what they believed, or what Ford believed, you know. And I think your father had, was instilled with those values. You knew right from wrong, you know. Policy is 
complicated and how he reacted in later years and what he did is obviously um, for historians to, to, you know, deal with, but it does speak to a certain personal characteristic that I think he, that he had. I wanted to read as we close out some beautiful parts of the memoir here about your dad. And I, wonderful. Um, you write predictably much of the attention showered on dad these days, positive and negative misses the mark. While it's true that many unfortunate political tendencies metastasized during the 80s, kowtowing to religious extremists, denigrating and ignoring empirical science, stoking irrational grassroots fears while cynically pandering to moneyed interest, they cannot all be attributed to Ronald Reagan. These, those tendencies long predate him and became far more extreme after he left the scene. Beyond a fondness for non-intrusive government, and top marginal tax rates for most of his years in office was 50%. He had little in common with the rage mongering infecting his party today, short circuiting the functions of government, potentially the country into ruin, just to score political points by pinning the blame on the opposition are tactics he would consider unpatriotic, not to mention undemocratic. Thought that was, you know, important. I mean, he wrote, he wrote that in 2011, almost presaging and almost being real prophetic uh, on what Trumpism <laughs> would become. I mean, it is interesting. Huh? I, I never could have believed in 2011 that we'd end up with a Donald Trump presidency. In fact, it, it wasn't until he secured the nomination uh, the first time in 2016 that I, I really took it seriously. Before that, I was one of these people saying, yeah, go ahead, nominate Donald Trump <laughs> to be president, nominate Bozo the Clown <laughs> to be president, you know, because uh, I couldn't believe that the American public would actually vote for this guy. And in fact, they didn't, but I hadn't factored in that electoral college. Well, but, and back to the electoral college thing before we close out too. Uh, that what makes this also harrowing is that even though Biden wins by seven and a half million votes in a popular vote, but we don't do the popular vote here, 45, 46,000 give or take votes among three states and Trump would have been reelected in 2020 after, after the absolute negligence and mismanagement of COVID. Right, right. After trading foreign policy favors. Yeah. Or you know, dirt on Biden, the Zelensky. Four hundred thousand people killed under his watch is what they say of of uh, of because of COVID. I mean, you think about that. That still 74, 75 million people still went again and said, after all of that, we will reelect you or try to. Yeah, and just the, the the we forget. I forget you. Yeah. I'm sure you forget some of the lunacy like during COVID when, when he remember at the very beginning when he wouldn't let that boat dock on the West Coast because. I he, do. Oh, he said, yeah, people and people, you know, we have such short memories. People are not remembering what they did yesterday, which is why he's getting slightly more haloed. How about the disease be gone by Easter? Do you remember that? Yeah. You know, when the sun comes out, it'll just go away. Or maybe we can inject bleach or right. maybe UV light up our behinds or you know, <laughs> whatever he was. You know, it was just this lunatic stuff. His refusal to wear a mask at the mask factory and then we we'll find out later why that is we right. find out way later why is he touring the mask factory everybody else has got their mask on but him yeah. so we we'll find out from from his assistant later on after the fact that it's because of the the, the orange makeup yeah a white mask and she realizes his orange pancake will get all over it and it'll look like a mess mm. and she in that and it's like oh well the mask has got to go then because i got the pumpkin thing going here you know? I, I think one of the scarier things and again this is just my view because we all know him as a popular uh, popu popular public figure and character this does not uh mitigate or um in any way leaven this guy's evil but because donald trump is very funny you know i i say he's rodney dangerfield meets benito mussolini that's not excusing it, but he has an ability to be funny and he has no sense of humor, but he has an ability to come off like a comedian. It makes it scarier. Like he can stand there and do this thing of, oh, the podium doesn't work. Who built this podium? What kind of country is this? And I know it sound, yes, not to you or to me, but I think that sells. I think it sells. I, by the way, you used to go on air. I was going to ask you this too. It's a wide ranging interview. We can jump from subject to subject. You used to go on air with a guy who worked for your father, Patrick B J. Buchanan. Of course, he started Nixon. And one, he, this guy used to terrify me. 
And one of the things I used to be terrified by, by Pat Buchanan was he would say the most outrageous, appalling stuff and go, oh, Chris, and he would laugh. Uh -huh. and then he, oh, this sort of weird geniality would overcome him and you'd forget, I think this guy's kind of an anti-Semite. I don't know. I didn't know him. Maybe he wasn't. I don't know. Uh, certainly, he I, certainly dabbled in Holocaust denial. Yes, right. Like, you know, he took up for John Demangic and all this stuff. And it was, yeah. Yes, but I, but he would laugh. And it's not that Trump does it, but to me, there's something so scary about, you know, the kind of clownish autocrat um, because I think it goes down easier for people. Yeah, it does. I mean, I guess we can be grateful that he doesn't have any real plans. Except That's true. He's an undisciplined autocrat, right? Yeah, he, he doesn't. He's not a, you know, he's not a Stalin or a Hitler or something like that, where they've got a real agenda laid oh, out. Yeah. You know, and then at first I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do that, and the end result is going to be this. He's he's chaotic. You know, it's it's all just about winning the day, winning the news cycle, and everybody look at me, and I'm so special. And he's, he's got a narcissistic personality disorder, and these people are, are yeah. you know, they live with this deep, deep shame. You know, they, they try to project strength, but really, he's like the weakest human being I've ever seen in my oh, life. Oh yeah, oh he's yeah, just he's I mean, so fragile. Um, so fragile. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, so, I mean, I think, yeah. The first thing they have in, in a high office, uh, not somebody who's, you know, you'd almost rather have a Vladimir Putin sort of guy who's, you know, he's terrible, he's awful, but he's got a certain confidence about what he's doing. Oh, yeah. You know? yeah. He's a KGB, uh, former KGB killer. I mean, yeah. yeah. He just ate, you know, I, he just ate Trump for lunch. I oh. mean, with right from the get-go. And so did Kim Jong-un. And when I've said to people, I had, I, I interview everybody on the show. We welcome everybody on. I mean, I say everybody, we don't have Marjorie Taylor Greene, but we have, we have had on a few Heritage Foundation people to help, to sort of try to unpack some of the things. When, when they say, you know, and this is the thing, it's a both things can be true. I am a, I try to think of things, think things through critically. Um, it can make, uh, I contain multitudes, I guess, as Whitman would say. So yes, I can decry some of the things Joe Biden does, but also say that doesn't make Donald Trump anything but a complete um, um, nothing. Yeah. A whack, a whack job, but nothing burger, to use his word, on the world stage. A narcissist who was played like a fiddle by Putin and Kim Jong-un, which is why he famously said he got along with him. They knew, they saw him coming a million miles. And I said to these right wing guys, I said, you guys think this is leadership. You're, got, you're getting played, but so is this country. Wake up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Very good. Yeah. I mean, I always say to people, you're mis misunderstanding the sociopathy, to use your words here, and how that uh, makes him very weak and yes. susceptible to flattery, which then, yeah, he probably would and has just gone ahead and traded secrets because why not? Oh, yeah. right away. The, yeah. His first day, he invited Lavrov and the Russian ambassador and a Russian photographer into the Oval Office all alone and handed them Israel's secrets regarding you know, terrorism. Yeah, there. back in 2017, right when he got in, you mean, right? Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. just imagine how stupid they thought he was at that moment. Uh, now, Ron, here's the most important I can't believe that this idiot <laughs> is doing this. <laughs> I know. Well, again, alas, here we are. But Ron, not to go back to the big news of the day, it's your 30th birthday today. Happy birthday. Yes. 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 You look great. Um, <laughs> given where you are on this uh, this another year around the sun here for Ron Reagan, what where where do you feel about what are you up to in your life? What what do you want? You've done so much. Do you have a next chapter you're planning? Is there a Ron Reagan show coming? Another book? No? Well, I, who knows about another book or something, but, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, this is the 36th anniversary of my 30th birthday. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I, I'm of an age now. I, I started working for a, for a living when I was 18. Right. And I didn't go to college, you know. And uh, oh, so, Wait, I thought you went to Yale for a second. For, for like three months. And yeah. then you joined the Joffrey. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. So, so I've been I've been working for a long time. And I yeah. decided at a certain point that, you know, I, I'll, I'll do what I want to do. <laughs> Not what somebody else wants me to do. I'm fortunate that I can, you know, afford to live, live a modest life, but without uh, depending on a paycheck at this point. So, uh, 
um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty happy about that. And we'll just see. Uh, I, I enjoy, uh, you know, coming and talking to people yeah. like yourself and, uh, you know, throwing my two cents in. But uh, I love it. We love to hear it. We, you know, who wouldn't want to have you folks? Ron Reagan Jr., the son of the 40th president of the United States. You bet your, you bet it that he has. I have meant to correct you before. Yes. One thing my father did was he did not want his son to have a junior attached to his name. So he gave me a different middle name. He was oh, Ronald and Reagan. I'm Ronald Prescott Reagan, and therefore not actually a junior. Oh, that's so. But God, I feel like half the time I see you refer to as Ron Junior. I don't because people. It's an easy way to differentiate. It's oh fun. yes, Ronald Prescott Reagan. Okay, we're going to alter the show notes. Ron Reagan. We will. Not a big deal, but I no. just throw I don't it. matter. You're just Ron Reagan. You're Ronald Prescott Reagan. I mean, that's, that's it. it. That's you can, it. Can we get get those down. Who's calling? I have a reservation, please. Hi, Ronald Reagan. Oh, Ronald. Reagan. In this era, they won't even know this. He think he's around. You know, people don't know anything anymore. Um, Ron, really been a pleasure. Stick around for a second for a few minutes after the show. But is there any way or where people can find you on the socials now before we sign off? No, no, no. That's something I don't do any social media. No, okay. and I'm much happier for it. <laughs> you're, 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 you're going to be more. You're more grounded and more sane. That's yes, yeah. yes. Your mental health is bubbled in the best way. Yeah. No, it's true. All right, Ron. Well, thank you for joining us. This has been a, a wonderful conversation. It's really a pleasure to have you folks. Uh, make sure that you, if you haven't read um, My Father at 100, which came out in 2011, uh, Ronald's, uh, Ronald, Ron Reagan's beautiful recollection and memoir on his dad. Um, beautifully, beautifully written. Um, and uh, yeah, um, as I said, it's been a joy for everybody else listening. As always, I tell you all to stay dirty, stay moderate, and stay safe.